right. which you obviously didn't see any action on Hawaii. Right. You then went from Hawaii sailing, mm. you thought, to Australia. So we thought we were going to Australia, but we stopped at New Caledonia. Okay. And, and that was, why did you get detoured to New Caledonia? Because of fighting there? or No, New Caledonia was on the way. But at New Caledonia, they had us pause for a couple of days, and we found out later it was because of arguments going on between MacArthur and Marshall about what should happen with uh, our division because we were scheduled for MacArthur. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, uh, we were. Twenty-fifth division was scheduled for MacArthur. Yeah, right. Yeah, okay. twenty-fifth division is scheduled for MacArthur, but because of the uh, reverses we were experiencing and difficulties on Guadalcanal, mm -hmm. they uh, thought that we were much better used up at Guadalcanal than going to Australia. Okay. So, what would you have done if you had gone to Australia? Would you have been part of a defense, a planned defense of of Australia, or you? Would, I think what would have happened if we went to Australia is we probably would have spent three to six months or some period of time training and getting acclimated to Australian uh, life and uh, climate because we'd probably be up in the north, mm -hmm. uh, which is a semi-tropical area. Mm -hmm. And then we'd probably be sent to New Guinea or some other operation up there. Okay. They might even save us for being landing troops on an invasion of... Um, New Britain Island or New Ireland or one of those other islands. But so then, basically, though, Marshall and MacArthur differed on how you'd be best used. As a result, you were sent to New Caledonia. Right. And then you were to, you ended up being utilized on Guadalcanal. Right, right. So what, I know Guadalcanal, uh, we attacked Guadalcanal on August 7th, 1942, and that was initially a marine operation. Right. So you went into relieve the Marines, would that be fair they, statement? That'd be a fair statement. We came in December of 42. Okay, so it's and, four uh, months later then. And uh, actually, for instance, when our company that I was in went up on the lines, we, the Marines were coming back down off the lines. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's a direct exchange, right, at points like that. Okay. So you and, saw some several weeks of combat. You said about mm, three weeks, I believe? About three weeks, yeah. And that culminated in the taking of a major objective, which is... Coconbona, yeah. Coconbona, and that was a section of Guadalcanal, mm -hmm. I guess. Well, it was a point on the north coast, which we centered and thought was kind of a central point for the Japanese, so we wanted to wipe it out uh, or capture it. And you did end up... Yeah, we did, yeah. ...doing that. And then after your time in combat, you... Um, spent some time, I believe, training scouts. Is that correct? Well, I was given that as a temporary duty. I didn't do, I probably didn't spend more than three weeks on that. Okay. But uh, the time I was in, from the middle of February till the end of July, of course, is about four or five months. Mm -hmm. And uh, during that period of time, I uh, spent most of my time uh, giving lectures on current events, mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, running a, just for a couple of weeks the scout school to teach them how to sketch and draw maps and and uh, analyze terrain and um, mm -hmm. viewing it and how you write it up and that sort of thing. Okay, so you were on Guadalcanal until approximately when? If you landed December 42, you were there? Until till the end of July. 43. 43, and uh, about the last day or two of July, we loaded boats to go up to New Georgia to fight there. Okay. So I was in New Georgia for uh, from the end of July to uh, all towards the end of September. Mm -hmm. And that's on the island? Uh, uh, on the island and around the New, New Georgia group, I would say. And that because I went, that includes Rundell and Sagar Caressa and other places like that, but they're really part of the same group of islands. Okay. And uh, then after that, I, I happened to go into the hospital. And uh, because of malaria and, and dinghy fever and underweight and various other things. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, what is dengue fever? Do you can you briefly describe it? Well, I don't know. It's something that they get in the tropics. Okay. <laughs> That's all. I really don't know much about it. I. Because you had malaria. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not sure about the dengue fever. I might have had it. Anyhow, I was underweight and not very good shape, so they built me up and sent me back to join the division in New Zealand because okay. the division went directly from the New Georgia to New Zealand for rest and rehabilitation and also uh, the division thought that they were going to get um, replacements there mm -hmm. and perhaps start some of our training of the replacements there before we went up to the islands or some other mission. So at this point it was later on in the fall of 1943? Yeah, that, that would have been in October of November of 43 that the division moved on to New Zealand. Okay. I don't think they got there until about the 1st of December. Okay. And what happened to them in the meantime, I'm not quite sure, but they weren't in combat. In that. Okay. And uh, the, uh, we were in there until about the middle of February. Okay. I, I joined them uh, in, in, after they'd been there for a while. Mm -hmm. And uh, however, I was fortunate to get a 10-day leave and... Uh, it just happened on a 10-day leave. I met a girl who became my wife. And, and, now going uh, on 66, 66 six, years? Is that yeah, that's right, 66 years this year. Well, that was certainly the best 10-day leave of your life then. Uh, uh, absolutely, right. So you were stationed mainly in Auckland, is that correct, or around? Uh, I, I was stationed at Walkworth, which is about 46 miles north of Auckland. Okay. It's out in the country, boondocks. Okay. And uh, the... Uh, we got sent up to New Caledonia about the middle of February. Of 44. 44, yeah. And I spent from the, uh, the end of February, 44, till the end of January, uh, mm -hmm. 45, about 11 months in uh, New Caledonia. Except that I got a 30-day leave to go down to visit my wife, which was the uh, month of January, 45. What did you actually, you were already married at that point? Then. We got married in uh, September. I got 10-day leave to come down and get married. Uh, okay. And that was... Uh, September of 44. September of 44, right. We're on New Caledonia. Yeah, and I, I had the choice of being rotated back to the United States, and uh, I turned that down. It, uh, had to so I could have the month with my wife, mm -hmm. and uh, I didn't mind going on up to whatever other, other service I might be called on, mm -hmm. and so that's what I did. I went up to the Philippines then afterwards, and uh, were you still with the 25th Division? No, 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 no. Uh, I left the 25th Division in uh, March of '44 to go to the headquarters of South United. United States Armed Forces in the South Pacific area. Okay. And the reason I went there was to work in the historical section, drawing maps and writing history of the Battle of Guadalcanal and New Georgia, but particularly Guadalcanal. Right. And uh, the uh, I joined the staff there in the historical section. Mm -hmm. the, the others were PhDs and much more qualified as historian writers and script writers, but they didn't know documents and military documents and how to read them and all that sort of thing, which I did, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, then when I got up to the Philippines, I got assigned to the Americal Division, which is the only unnumbered division in the American the U.S. Army. And that comes from America and New Caledonia? Yeah. Uh, uh, first, uh, what happened was that the uh, Early in '42, they sent a regiment of National Guard down to uh, New Caledonia, along with uh, bits and pieces of other organizations, and established a defense of New Caledonia. So that the Japanese decided to get it because New Caledonia is a vital link between the United States and Australia. They, we would have been cut off from Australia. It's, through by the Pacific route, if if um, 
New Caledonia got taken. Mm -hmm. So we just couldn't allow that to happen. Had New Caledonia been in Japanese hands earlier in the war? No, it was never in Japanese hands. Okay. N never got it. It was French. Okay. So we had trouble with the Vichy French in there. Mm -hmm. who were pro-German, and so therefore they weren't uh, m very much interested in our cause. <laughs> but uh, I didn't have any part in that. That was, the, the French were all right with us. Uh, they liked our money. Right. And, uh, the, so the Americal Division then was originally a, a defense form mm, for defensive purposes yeah, on the Caledonia. Right. But it then ended up participating in the liberation of the Philippines. Right. Well, what happened is that they, that took units from the task force defending New Caledonia and formed a new division out of it. Okay. And instead of giving it a number, they had Americans in New Caledonia, so they called it Americal. That's, okay. So that's its official name. It's the only division in the Army which had no um, number. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, I'm not sure when it was deactivated, but I think they kept it for a while after the war. Mm -hmm. No other occupation and things like that were going on, but I just don't know much about that. Mm -hmm. uh, well, no, no, I do know. I'm sorry. I have to take that back. When I got sent home in November of 45, uh, they were deactivating the Marical, so the Marical would no longer exist after that. Okay. Uh, so you went to 45. the Philippines and you were linked. You were placed in the Americal Division. Yeah, I was a captain then. And you were led, uh, led the infantry, is that right? Or? Yeah, I was still infantry, yeah. Okay. And I, they, they appointed me as a company commander okay. of a company three days before they were to make a beachhead on a new island. Which island was that? Uh, that was Cebu Island. Okay. From, they were coming from, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Negros Island. We were coming from Cebu Island. Okay. I was on Cebu Island and I joined the outfit and uh, the, the company I was appointed company commander and had lost their company commander, the first sergeant, uh, some of their officers and other people because they got caught up on gathering around the top of some hill, which uh, there were higher hills held by the Japanese and uh, the Japanese spotted them there and they just sh shot them and they, they killed them. Mm -hmm. So they had this company which is kind of shattered a bit, and they needed somebody to be company commander. I've often wondered why they, I got selected for that, because I was coming from one almost one year of uh, historical section experience. But then I, if I look at my 201 file, I, I can see in there that I got the Legion of Merit Award on Guadalcanal. So they probably figured I was a good combat person. I had a combat infantryman's badge. Mm -hmm. What's a 201 file? Well, that's that's the file that has a list of all your in, 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 uh, assignments. Okay. Uh, it has it, it, It's like a a, a, a personnel file. Mm -hmm. It tells you were in this position, then that position. Mm -hmm. Every time you got changed from one thing to another, any time you got a promotion, mm -hmm. any time you took leave. Or any other thing happened, you, you, it'll all be noted down there. It's it's a rather complete dossier, dossier on, on a person. Okay. And uh, anyhow, I, I took uh, I was on several islands in the Visayan group, which is the center part of the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And uh, then when the war ended, we were getting ready for the invasion of Japan. And incidentally, I had another chance to. <clears throat> get rotated back to the States in June of 45. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, um, my wife's in New Zealand. I came into the war, and I be it was by that time, I'd, they had transferred me from the rifle company commander to being in the operations section of division headquarters. This was on, in the Philippines? In, in the Philippines, in, in the Americal Division. Uh, Mm -hmm. I liked that, and I felt I was doing had a job to do there, and I could do it. It was something that fitted my capabilities and stuff. So I, instead of taking the rotation back to the states, I signed up for the stay in again. Mm -hmm. So I was then expecting to be in the invasion of Japan. Mm -hmm. Instead, I was in the occupation of Japan because they immediately reversed our roles in August. Mm -hmm. Uh, but they gave us two jobs to do this first start with. One is to disarm 
the Japanese and the Visayan group. And for instance, on Cebu Island, we thought we had 6,000 Japs there that were fighting our division. Turned out to be about 15,000. Mm. And uh, we found we regularly underestimated the number of Japs that were in the hills and so forth. At the, mm -hmm. and this uh, is at this point, though, although the war was not over, the Philippines were deemed to be secured. That, that oh no, they, they, well, uh, uh, the Philippines were considered to be uh, partially secured and the security had to be completed. Okay. But it wasn't going to win the war against Japan at right. that point. Right. For instance, when we had uh, fighting on Negros Island, which we made the beachhead on, mm -hmm. and uh, we were fighting up a mountain, and uh, I'd call for artillery fire on a machine gun position in front of us while they'd fire maybe three rounds and say they can't fire anymore today because that's their quota. And the reason for that is because uh, the bulk of the stuff is going in priority is Okinawa. Really? So you were sort of yeah. restricted in how much yeah, right. artillery ammunition you could use? Yeah, so I got myself... Uh, well, what I did actually is that uh, when... Uh, that happened. I didn't try to attack anymore. I figured why sacrifice men when we, this job should be done by artillery. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyhow, the battalion commander didn't think I was aggressive enough, so I got relieved of my command. <laughs> okay. And that's when I got down to, to division headquarters, was assigned into the as a liaison officer in the S3 section. What which is S3, S3 is operations. Okay. We, in other words, when an attack order comes, for instance, when we were planning for the invasion of Japan, I was one of the few people, uh, especially at the rank of captain, mm -hmm. who had access to the plans for the invasion of Japan because uh, in our division, mm -hmm. because uh, I was in the S3. It was part of my job. We had what we call the war room, the little shack, and was nobody was around. They had a guard on it at all times. They had all the orders and stuff about the invasion of Japan. Mm -hmm. But uh, nobody's allowed to take the stuff out, and uh, uh, there's no orders to get around. But everybody knew what was happening, except they didn't know when and how and where. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I, I knew where and when and what our role was. Our role was to send one regimental combat team into Shikoku Island, which is a little island between the, I guess it's the Sea of Japan and the Japanese Nippon Island, which is the main island. Well, the main islands were Hokkaido and Honshu and Kyushu. Mm. And which is the one that you're talking about? Uh, Kyushu. Kyushu. Yeah, that's, that's just south of the main island of Honshu. And it's a, if you go to the west end of it a little bit, you will come up to a, a straits and place where Nagasaki would be, mm -hmm. the big Japanese naval base. But Shikoku didn't have any big base on it like that that I remember about now. So Shikoku was... Yeah, that, yeah that's where, where we're supposed to have a regimental combat team go in. And I think we were to attack that five days before the main landing. So that the, all the news and everything else that goes out and be getting out for up to five days would be about all the fighting on this island mm -hmm. with no indication there's going to be any fighting on any other island. But then the big invasion comes because this was diversionary. And our other two regiments were held in reserve for the main attacks on the, you know, the plains and the, the fields just west of Tokyo, between Tokyo and the Ridge of Mountains, which ran between Tokyo and the other big cities in Japan west of that. I can't think of the name of it. Uh, Fujisan was uh, north of it, and you could see, the, see it from the ocean when you got that far. So these were all plans that yeah. you knew about? Yeah, right. Too. Right, and uh, for instance, uh, they were going to have the first CAV attack and land at Atsugi Air Base, which is a big Japanese air base in that field, area field. Well, they landed there. We were to come in from the sea and land at Yokohama, mm -hmm. which we did. 
and we were the first Americans to land in, in Japan from the sea. But this was as a peacekeeping force at that point? Oh, yes, oh, yes, right. But you said 1st Cav, was that part of the American? The, the, no, the, the 1st Cavalry Division was, was uh, MacArthur's favorite group because I guess he belonged to it once many when he was a younger man. And that was actually an armored unit, or? That, 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 to be armored and all that sort of thing. Basically, it's what they, they all rode horses and so forth. They were the cavalry in the old wars, the Spanish-American World War II, uh, World War I. Civil War, yeah, and Civil War, and that sort of stuff. World War I, I guess they got the B-tank groups and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, But that would have been an armored unit that would have gone in? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and, and but the war ended up being over. How long were you in the Philippines total, would you say? Probably from when? Well, I was probably there from about March to uh, the end of August. Let's see, March. N not, I don't count March. April, May, June, July, August. About four or five months. Okay, and then the war was over. And yeah. you ended up as part of the American. Yeah, yeah right. Going, and what island did you go into? Well, we went into the mainland. We went and landed at Yokohama, okay. which is a port city for Yo Tokyo. Okay. So Yokohama we were, is a port city for Tokyo. Yeah, and uh, our troops, or I, don't, I say our troops, I mean American troops now, went into Tokyo a few days after we landed there. Mm -hmm. But we took the area west of it. But I don't think we were the ones who went into Tokyo first. I, I, I really don't know who did now at this point. You never got to Tokyo? Either. Oh yeah, I got to Tokyo numbers of times. I used to, of course I uh, had a little private war of my own trying to get my wife to the States and uh, or myself down to New Zealand. So I, the place where I fought my war was in MacArthur's headquarters in the Daiichi building in Tokyo. But now how long were you stationed in Japan? Well, from about the first part of September till the end of November. Okay. Three months. Okay, so relatively short. Period. Yeah, right. Yeah. And then you were at that time struggling to handle the logistics of getting your wife stateside. Yeah, right. Or for you to go to New Zealand to right. see her first? Or? Right. Yeah, right. So what I, ultimately happened? Well, she got to stateside, but not until March of 46. And you got there first, I assume. Oh, hell yeah. So you went home to the States in November of 45? No, I got home on Christmas Eve. Oh, 45. Wow, yeah, that was New Haven. Yeah, that's why right. a big snowstorm or two. My dad came up to Devons to pick me up and we drove back through the snow I storm. Guess. Well, I'll tell you what, we've, we've sort of given a, a, an overview. So what I'm going to do now is to go back through some specific questions, um, sort of hitting on some of the more, what we'll call prosaic or mundane questions. and. I'll start with your initial entry into the Army. Were you drafted or did you enlist? I <coughs> was neither. I Well, <laughs> I, I was a reserve officer. Okay. And actually what was unfortunate for me is that I was an inactive reserve officer, so I couldn't get promoted to first lieutenant, although my age and other qualifications should have uh, led to a first the uh, lieutenant rank, but I went in as a second lieutenant. Okay, so you went in, you left, you went from the reserves into the regular From, from the inactive reserves. Inactive. They said I wasn't physically fit, so what they said. Okay. And of course when the war came along, they, their standards changed a bit. <laughs> okay. They, they waived the, my, it was only being underweight, basically, was the main thing that bothered them. They felt that you were underway. Yeah, yeah. So where where were you living when the war broke out? Well, I was living in Cleveland. I was practicing law. You were practicing law in, in Cleveland, yeah. And so what what law school did you go to? Michigan, Ann Arbor. So you you probably were practicing law for just a couple of years. At that oh, not that at all. I graduated from law school in June of forty one. Oh, okay. So you had just started. And I went down to take the State Department exams in September of forty one. Mm -hmm and didn't pass them, and uh, so I decided I'd get a job in practicing law in Cleveland. So I'd only been there a couple months okay. when the war came along. Okay, and then at that point you, I mean, you, you were already in the reserve, so they decided to make you 
a first lieutenant? Oh, no, no, they didn't do that. They decided to call me up, okay. and they changed the whole process for promotions and everything else. Mm -hmm. And uh, they wanted to send me to Fort Benning for training as first, and so that's where I went, down to Fort Benning. And this was right after Pearl Harbor? Right, yeah. Okay. So you're, you went to Fort Benning for, for training? For three months, yeah. For three months. And mm -hmm. was that with the 25th Division? Had you been a student? Oh, oh no, no, no. That, that's, you're a complete casual then. You're just a student. Okay. I was in, they call our class Basic 26. They, Basic 26. Yeah. Right? They, uh, you refer to it as a casual in the sense of Oh, yeah. Right. You no assignments. So you're just getting trained. Okay. You're raw material at that point. You're raw material. The, now, then, uh, then when I finished that, they told us that uh, the single people would get sent overseas, and the married couples would get sent to camps for training and, and organizing, doing various things in the states. So I was single, and uh, they sent me over out to California to go overseas to the Pacific. Where in California did you go? Oh, no, the, I, I was destined for overseas. I just went to California, the port, to pick up the ride. Oh, okay. I went to Fort Mason. Okay. Actually, I was, I was in Fort Mason before they got transportation for me for a couple of weeks, and uh, I met uh, Ronald Reagan while I was there. You did? Yeah. Under what type of circumstances? He was already a well-known yeah. actor then. Oh, yes, he was. That's how I knew who he was. I, I was uh, appointed investigating officer, being a lawyer. So was, while I was waiting, they made me investigating off through auto accidents and things like that from Fort Mason. And uh, I used to, for instance, go over to Oakland to the jail to interview some witness or somebody in various other places. And uh, I would come in, I'd have a driver assigned to me to drive me around to get to the witnesses and uh -huh. get their statements and things. And then when i come back, I'd go into the officer's uh, cafe there and have lunch and it could be any time of day because uh, when you're doing a job like I'm doing you don't work till 12 noon break it off and start again at 1 and so forth. Mm -hmm. I guess I was coming in late one day about 2 o'clock or so and Ronald Reagan was sitting at a table by himself and I hadn't noticed that until I'd already sat down at a table next to him was he in the service uh, himself? Oh, yes. Yeah, so he was a captain at the time in uniform. And the table was as big as this for, for poor people. So it's like he sat right over there. And I recognized him. And so I introduced myself, said I enjoyed his pictures and so forth. Huh. And so he said, you know, thank him very much. And said he was in special services and supposed to uh, work on the morale and entertainment of his troops and that sort of thing. Huh. And very friendly, and that's about all there was to it. Wow, so you met a, met a star on your way off to go overseas. Then. Yeah, right. Um, okay, so typically we, we might ask the question why you picked the branch that you did, but you were already in the Army Reserve, so yeah. there really wasn't a choice to be made. Yeah, um, and even there, I'd say uh, there wasn't any choice if I wanted to take any military training at the university because at that time the only thing they offered was infantry mm -hmm. and there was no navy no marines no anything else do you remember mm -hmm. that boot camp training at fort benning pretty well or? oh yeah sure i remember it was it very arduous did you were you just worn out all the time did you actually enjoy it uh, did you make a, did you make some friends or develop relationships oh yes i d made friends and, and relationships uh, some of them went over to were part of the army that invaded italy and and we've been in North Africa. I remember some of them, some of them, various other places. I remember things like this. We went out on a field trip. Of course, down in, in, in February or March, it's uh, chilly, but it's not as cold in Georgia as it is up north. Right. And uh, they used to take us out in trucks, standing up in trucks. So you, you, you'd be in the back of a truck, and I don't know, maybe there were 30 men in it or something. Or other. It'd be crowded anyway. We got out in this field, and I remember a fellow by the name of Brinkley, who was from Kentucky. And uh, we were, after we started to get in the truck to come back, he had a, or somebody had a small snake they had in their hand. And uh, it finally got into his hands, and there got to be a big bet around, 50 cents uh, uh, that he wouldn't bite the head off. 
And um, everybody got into it, I think, except myself. I wouldn't bet. They kind of annoyed at me for not betting, but I didn't, didn't want to do that. But he did it. He bet it off and spit it out. Did you really? <laughs> oh, yeah, you really did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. At the end, they had a, a obstacle course where you were supposed to run in a certain places you cross a stream, and there would be a sniper sitting there. You don't know what you're going to get when you start on it. It, unless you heard something from somebody who'd been on it before, but even there, I think they changed mix, it. Mix, change it around. And so when I ran on mine, the only thing I remember about that is when I uh, uh, went, to, I saw the, the sniper in the, in the bush on the other side of the stream when I was crossing it. I raised my bayonet up like that and went like I was going to hit him like that and going down on him. He got up and ran. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like that you would have. You would have won that competition. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you remember any of your instructors at all? Or? Not particularly, no. Okay. I remember instructors in ROTC in Michigan, but that's different. Right. Okay, so after that, you headed briefly through Fort Mason in California, and then from there on to Hawaii, is that correct? Right, that's correct. Okay. All right. And what did you do in Hawaii? We didn't really talk about that before. Well, what we did in Hawaii is went down, we were assigned to beach positions. Okay. And uh, our, we had a sector which was about 2,000 yards wide and 1,000 yards deep, including Fort Weaver at the west side of Pearl Harbor. Okay. And, uh, you showed me that on those maps. Yeah. And uh, uh, the, uh, I lived in a garage, which was what well, didn't have a side down to the ground, but it had about a, an open foot, about a foot above the ground. I guess it's to save things from rotting because of the weather and that sort of thing. I don't know why, but anyhow, there. And they didn't have any front to them, so you could close the garage and have it closed off, but it's closed three quarters of the way around. And, uh, we would have cots and things in there, it's, and uh, if there'd be people's houses, and the, the residents were not required to move out or anything, they were still there next door. So I made friends with the residents and kept writing to them for many years afterwards. Huh. And uh, uh, Interesting. So the, 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 the fellow that was a, the, the husband or the man in the family, was at Port Island at the time the Pearl Harbor happened, and he was telling about his experiences on Fort Island, which I thought was interesting. Hmm. So you got, these were, this was another somebody else in the military that you got to be. He was no, he wasn't in the military. He's civilian working there, and just as a civilian with the Navy. Then you corresponded with him after the war. Yeah. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh wow. Okay. So how long were you in Hawaii? Would you say? Well, I was in Hawaii from about. Uh, April until uh, we left at the end of October, so that'd be six months, would it be, or six or seven months. Okay, and then that was when you then sailed for Australia, right? But you were diverted to in, in New Caledonia. New Caledonia. So you really spent yeah. a couple of, you had a couple stays in New Caledonia because you had one almost a year or two yeah, years yeah. later when you were doing your mapping. Well, of course, the first time we stopped in Caledonia, we just sat on our ships in the dock in the harbor. Okay. And uh, w they, we were not allowed to go to shore. Oh, really? I, I don't know who went ashore, but I suppose some of the higher-ups got ashore all right, but not, not the bulk of us. Okay. So you then went on to Guadalcanal. Yeah. And can you, can you tell me, you saw combat there. Can you share some impressions of, of combat? I mean, was it? Uh, I would imagine, of course, it was the first time you saw anybody killed or, or injured. Yeah. Um, I don't know how close you were to the enemy. Did you? Did you see mm -hmm. dead Japanese? Were you actually? Oh yeah, it's nice. I mean, you could see. I don't. Mm. I, one hesitates to ask a, a, a veteran, mm -hmm. hey, "How many Japanese yeah. did you kill?" But can you briefly yeah. describe yeah. your combat? Maybe, maybe one of your most vivid memories. All right, go ahead. Um, about combat. Oh, yeah, I mean, in the company I was in, uh, there was a couple people killed, uh, uh, officers. Mm -hmm. And as I say, I got, because I got assigned to a new company in a new regiment, mm -hmm. 
uh, I didn't know anybody hardly when I got in there. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the first night that we were up in combat, we were given the job as, as taking a patrol out. I was given the job taking. All right. So as you were saying, you were describing your combat experience on Guadalcanal. Yeah. And uh, well, I was just telling about the first patrol I took. I had um, six men assigned to me, and I was told to contact. Of course, I was in the first battalion, and the first battalion was supposed to contact the third battalion, according to the regimental commander who was down on the beach and he didn't have any idea what the terrain was up there and he hadn't been around there or anything mm -hmm. and he wanted some, a patrol go out from us to the other side to make contact with him and tell him where we were well we were on top of these ridges and when we, when we got up there I could wave at him and uh, to me that didn't make any sense at all that uh, we're not going to hold anything. It wasn't to fight anybody down there. It was just to go contact them and tell them. I can see them, and they can see us. And uh, so I argued with the company commander when I was sent to take the patrol down. This was getting kind of late in the day. Mm -hmm. And he, he said, well, he agreed with me, but, uh, you know, it's an order. So so let's talk to the battalion commander. His name was Journey, J-U-R-N-E-Y. And so we talked to Journey, and Journey says he agreed too, but... Uh, that's an order. So, in the end, I took the patrol, and uh, you were a, a, a second lieutenant. Still? Second lieutenant, yeah. Okay, so you took. I stayed a second lieutenant a long time, all the Guadalcanal, and didn't get it first lieutenant till I was in New Georgia. Okay. But uh, the uh, uh, I took the six men they gave me to go with me on this patrol, and uh, I told them, now, "I've got an order." And I've got to go because I've been ordered to do it. And I decided I'd, I would go. Mm -hmm. But I said, I think it's asinine. I don't believe in it. And uh, it, no, none of, I'm not giving anybody an order to go. You don't have to go if you don't want to. Mm -hmm. And much to my surprise, every one of them went. Wow. And we went down in there. It was dark by the time we got up to the other side, which is about 1,000 um, yards, 800, over a half mile. And... Uh, we got up to the other, the other side and didn't run into any fire or any trouble at all, except going up the hill. I thought I saw a Jap in a hole there in a little cave. Like I fired my rifle at it from my hip, mm -hmm. and uh, a couple of days later, when he could go down and check it, I went down, and found the place, and if I had, if it had been a man in there, I would have hit him between the eyes. Right. Uh, that that's shook from the hip. I thought that, <laughs> that's what you're doing. You're under under you know stress like that. Uh -huh. Anyhow, we got up and onto the other thing. Then we couldn't get back because uh, of the Japs being down in there. I, I ran. I think the reason I got through it the way I did was because the, the Japs were not used to having the Americans go out after dark mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. and so they weren't prepared for. Anything like that going on, I, that's the only reason I can account for my not getting fired at or running into something. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, they, uh, I took out a couple other patrols after that, but they uh, gave me the Legion of Merit for that. Wow, well, that is impressive. Yeah. Now, were you ever any large skirmishes where there were, you know, large numbers of enemy coming at you? you were no, no, never, never anything like that. It was always small. Stuff, small actions? Small actions, stuff going on, yeah. Okay. I yeah. assume, though, you, if you didn't, did you actually um, encounter Japanese prisoners? I oh, I took was, one prisoner. You did take, take a prisoner? Yeah, I took a prisoner up in Sagacarasa Island. That was later on? Uh, that's later in New Georgia, yeah, right. Okay. But when you were on uh, Guadalcanal? I didn't take any prisoners, no. I didn't get that close to any of them alive. But, uh, I, I, I saw some who were prisoners and being taken back mm -hmm. from from ours. And, of course, when we captured Cocombona, there were bodies all over the place. They were piled up. I mean, they'd be six feet high, bodies. This is Japanese charges or something? Oh, no, no. This is from bombardment and machine gun fire and other stuff. Huh. And... Uh, uh, was well, it tough for you to see? To see? No, I, I don't know. We we would eat our rations right with it all around us. 
I don't know. You, you get, the, you know, you just have to accept what you got. That's right. all. Uh, I didn't like it, and actually, we had one. Uh, I don't. I, I probably I'm being unfair, and I shouldn't really mention it or anything. But uh, I didn't think very much of the regimental commander we had. I we used to call him the Great White Father, and uh, thought that he was pretty poor because he would give all these orders out, and he wouldn't really didn't have any map of of the area to to show it. He's just going on the phone by what other people had. Gen now, General Collins, our division commander, he'd actually come up to the front lines and would be all around there mm -hmm. and ordering things on. He 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 was had, he was a hands-on man, and he was, mm -hmm. you know, just the way you you expect the tactical group to operate and with their leader and so forth. So you but the, the fellow, the trouble with this fellow that uh, uh, we call the Great White Father, he was a veteran from World War One. And he was over 50 years old and probably physically wasn't in the best shape either. So I, you know, I'm probably being unfair to him. Uh, he's probably had his good days and stuff. And mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of assigning people the jobs that they weren't really equipped for in the military. I guess any other organization, especially when you build them up fast, right. you, it's hard to pick the right ones. Mm -hmm. And I... And when they're in a place where they, you would hurt their feelings and everything because they don't get it, and they they don't feel their inadequacy themselves because they've never been in this situation. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's another situation. I think that's the kind of thing he was in. Mm -hmm. Well, now you have the you have the twenty fifth division you were in, which had three regiments. Yeah. Each regiment had how many battalions? Three battalions, three combat battalions. Three combat battalions, yeah. and each battalion had how many companies? Four. No, well, yeah, it had four companies: three uh, rifle companies and one weapons company, and then a headquarters company too. I, I guess the headquarters company was with a division, uh, probably a battalion, did, with a regiment rather. So, with three, each regiment had three battalions. Yeah. Which had four companies. Right. Which would be. Three infantry companies and one heavy weapons company. Yeah. Okay. Just trying to understand the yeah. new organization a little bit. Um, okay. So your your units, you did see, you were in a unit that um, your company that you were in on Guadalcanal did see some casualties. Then you. Oh, that's sure. We sure did. Yeah. Some and guys and we, we got got into combat and so forth, but it, uh, it wasn't any big banzai attacks or anything like that. Right. But you were awarded. You said a Legion of Merit. Yeah. And that was for leading that patrol under... Well, I, I guess it's, yeah, that's what it says in the citation. Well, it, it sounds yeah. very impressive to me. Um, okay. So we talked about that. Um, on... Um, you, you basically... We, we talked about New Georgia. Then you were relieved. You, you had to go to a hospital for a little while. Then you went to New Zealand, where you met your wife, and then from New Zealand, you went back to New Caledonia. Is that correct? Right. Okay. So they, while you were actually in New Zealand, you were tapped to become a, a map maker. No, no, no. I was tapped in New Caledonia. We were already back up in New Caledonia when they, you see. Still with the 25th division? Yeah, I still with the 25th division. Okay. And uh, we were starting our training then. Okay. But we really hadn't gotten very far into it okay. when, when I, this invitation came and I accepted it. And that was at the division yeah. level? Yeah. Well, the, the, the S3, or G3 rather, the division, or G2 rather, was the one I got well acquainted with and so forth. And when they came from, in from headquarters, that's the South Pacific headquarters, looking for somebody like myself to work with him, he thought of me. Mm -hmm. And he thought of me because of the map work I did on the ship and mm -hmm. on Guada Guadalcanal. Well, now, G what is the G2? Intelligence. G2 is intelligence. And G3 is in, uh, operations. G1 is personnel. G4 is supplies, in effect. Then what are, what are the S designations, like S1, S2? Well, S2? they're just in the lower level. One's G is general level. The S is... Um, is uh, 
specific? No, uh, regimental and uh, regimental and battalion level. Okay. Right. That's probably a special word for the S, but I can't remember what it is now. Perhaps subordinate. Yeah. Okay, so when you were picked for your map making abilities, uh, when you were back on New Caledonia, that was still for the 25th Division. No, it was for headquarters South Pacific. Okay, that's right. So you were yeah, left yeah. It out of the I, I, I left the 25th Division then, yeah. So that map making primarily revolved around what you would call topographical campaign maps yeah. of the Guadalcanal campaign. Well, they weren't supposed to be topographical, except I made them topographical. Okay. But they were supposed to be maps showing the movements of the troops and everything, but if you show the movement of the troops and everything, it's all on flat paper, no, no indication of how up, up and down it was. Right. It's not very good. You had to do something about that. And so you so added that extra I, dimension. Yeah, I added that dimension. I, I used artillery registration points also to deter, deter, plus aerial photos. I you didn't I didn't show you any aerial photos here because I don't think I kept any there all within the file down there, with it. But I used the aerial photos, the uh, um, uh, artillery registration points. Which, for instance, you got a a, a, a battery of. of one five fives on the which is only ten feet above sea level, and you're fighting a target that's five hundred feet up the mountain there, and it's one mile away. Uh, it's you fire you're setting the range and so forth is different than it would be if it was sea le ground level, mm -hmm. because it's high up. You got to make allowances for that. For so so there, so the, so their data was very valuable for me in drawing my maps because I could. They would say that the target was a certain amount of feet high, and when I see a river coming around like this or a stream and that sort of thing, and they say right here is 500 feet high, I know the river can't be 500 feet high, you know, so I work it out, and I make estimates. That's what, the way I made it. Anyhow. So you use basically artillery registration points, aerial mm, photographs, yeah. and your own deductive logic to yeah. make. Yeah, and I've been on the ground in Guadalcanal, so I knew the ground too. Right. Well, now, at the, what was the original reason for you making these maps? It was meant to be used for the official history of the... Yeah, the history, yeah. It was part of the history. It was not part of the operations reports. Okay. It had nothing to do with that because that's done by the unit itself. Okay. And what yeah. do you mean by operations report? Well, an operations report is what you have to keep and file at the end of a campaign. And it's all that you do day by day, and where your troops are day by day, and okay. what your problems are, is supplies, is casualties, uh, mm -hmm. who you captured, how much ground you took, all kinds of, any information which in, uh, tells about what you did. So right. that when somebody in the end wants to know what happened to this month, they can go to these operations reports and they can tell us, put together what really happened in a month mm -hmm. by going day by day in that, from the reports. Okay, but your your maps were more for history, history. history. Yeah, right. Way. Absolutely. Yeah. So you must have worked in a, in in a very detailed way on those maps. Because I did. You spent many months making them. That's why I did. Well, you can see from looking at them. They did. They, and they no, no, nobody's nobody's challenged them. I mean, they were accepted, but right down the line, which surprised me. I thought somebody might go back and. Mm -hmm. Do a little more checking on that or anything, but they didn't do it. Or if they did, they found it good enough to, for their purposes to leave it. So there's been nobody else, yeah. as far as you know, that has done these of Guadalcanal. So That's right. To, to my knowledge, you know, I, I suppose today with civilization, civilization going on the way like it is and the change of local people living down there and everything, they probably got things now that are much better than anything I drew. But uh, Well, on the other uh, hand, some of the some of the topography and uh, so forth might have changed a little bit. Oh, of course. the advance of civilization. Yeah. So what you did captured it as it was then. That's right. Which makes it truly definitive. That's right. Question, yeah. Which is a, a very impressive feat. Yeah. And you did that really for about 10 months, would you say? Yeah, months? right. About, about ten, 9 or 10 months. Okay. All right. Well, then let me ask you the, a few other sort of basic questions about sort of more holistic questions. How did you stay in touch with your family? Did you correspond a lot with your family? or? Yeah, by letters. Okay. Do any of those letters survive? 
Oh, yes, yeah. You have everything else, so I figured you must quite possibly mm -hmm. have some letters. Well, they uh, all the letters sent to me, I would bundle up uh, every few months and mail back home. So I, I had 15 packets of letters which were sent to me during the war. Okay. And uh, the, uh, I'd tell my mother to just save them for me. And when the war is over, I'd check them out and I'd figure well, what I want to keep and throw away. Right. But as things often happen, I, I was doing other things when I got back from the war. Right. So when she died in 95, 1995, that's uh, 50 years later, those letters are still unopened. So all the letters that your family sent to you, you would then bundle and send yeah. back to them for safety. Yeah, that's right, and they hadn't been opened for 50 years after that. Do you have any of the letters that you sent to them? Well, some. I mean, they didn't. They weren't as systematic as I was. But also, my letters weren't necessarily that good because I felt a heavy hand of censorship right. and and security, right. and I complied with it. I didn't try to beat it or anything. So right. the letters weren't as good as they might have been otherwise. Okay. Um, I have one interesting incident that happened on that. Okay. Uh, on Sagar Karasa. Okay. Incidentally, I still well, I, can't say that very well. Sagar Karasa. Yes, yeah, Sagar Karasa. Right. Okay. They, uh, uh, one of the other official operations reports that the division filed during the war, which I've seen, says that there was no fighting on Sagar Karasa, which is not true at all. Mm -hmm. I don't know where they got it from, but uh, uh, because that's where Lieutenant Rochester got killed. And we lost other men, and you know that that's where I was <coughs> with, with the uh, Major Davis and the, the chaplain when the the Japs fired on us, and I was shaking, trying to get a little strengthening from the others, and found they were shaking too. So I went ahead and relaxed on it. And of course, Davis had got the Congressional Medal of Honor in Guadalcanal, so. So you were actually uh, searching for cover from enemy fire on this island and you are joined by a Medal of Honor recipient and his name you said is Richard Davis? No, no, uh, Charles Davis. Charles Davis. Yep. Well, well the, I was his S2 intelligence officer. Okay. He was a battalion commander and he and I were going on the island. Of course, he, he commanded the troops going over there and told Company I would go this way and Company M that way or set up their weapons somewhere and all that sort of thing. But we wanted to set up a, a battalion headquarters, mm -hmm. which would be, you know, we is where all the commands would come out from and that sort of thing. And he and I thought it would be good to, to have it over towards the villa where you you could look across Bracket Straits and see the Japanese over there right from our where where our headquarters was. Mm -hmm. And uh, we thought we could get get away with that and. We were just standing there, getting ready for it, when suddenly the Japanese opened up on us. And the chaplain happened to be with us at the time, so we all dropped down behind the tree trunk. I say the tree trunk could have been at the top of it, could have been almost as high, high as this table off the ground, but may not have been quite that high. I can't remember now just what, but we were laying out flat behind it, and the machine gun was coming along like that. It was the Japanese. And I felt a bit of bark coming down my neck uh, from uh, wow. the from from the ch chips from the tree, that, and that that's when I was shaking like that, and I figured to myself, God damn it, hook, get a hold of yourself, and, uh, and then I thought, well, the chaplain, that'll make me feel better. So I looked over at him, and I found he was shaking like that too. And besides that, he had his butt up in the air, which I thought was very. <laughs> Very poor judgment. Fortunately, he, he, he might have, but he didn't. And then I thought, well, Davis, he got the Congressional Medal of Honor for leading a charge up on Guadalcanal. He'll, he'll probably be, you know, real. That, that seeing him will encourage me a lot. And I looked at him, and he was just as nervous as the rest of us. Wow. So I said to myself, well, I'll hook, relax, and the hell with it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So does that tie in in any way with letter writing or communicating with your family or? That's just an incident. That that's just an incident I was telling about. Oh, oh, no, no, that's right. I, I was going to come to the incident I want to tell you about. Right. Lieutenant Rochester was up on the line, and when the Japanese attacked, he got killed, he was shot and killed. And uh, he was a good friend of mine. He's from North Carolina, and he was uh, 
uh, had a, his wife had a baby girl while he was overseas, and he never saw his daughter. And his daughter never saw him. I thought it was a terribly sad thing and really tough. And everything. I was, uh, jotted down a little piece of paper. I was going to write his wife when I got out of combat and could get around and write a letter. Mm -hmm. Well, after that, I went to the hospital and all the rest of the stuff, and it wasn't until 1995 I saw that little note and thought to myself, for over 50 years, and I haven't written. But he came from a small town in North Carolina, and I got the map out and found it on the map and so forth. So I wrote to the postmaster of the, of the uh, town. I sent a stamped envelope in there, or a stamped card in there to send back to me. If he could give me the address of, of the widow of this man or anything else about the family. He knew all about the family. Besides that, I got a phone call in about 10 days from the daughter. The one that she never met. Yeah, right. His, her, her mother died in the meantime, so I could never talk to the wife. But uh, they had, this is, shows me that there's value in, in keeping track and the records and talking to people because they thought he was killed on Guadalcanal. Oh. They didn't even know he, all this other stuff he went through and the rest of it. <coughs> and uh, they, the uh, record center in St. Louis got burned up, and so a lot of those specific records are gone. Mm -hmm. And But I was able to tell her that, no, he wasn't killed on Guadalcanal. He, he f lived that and went on to fight another battle. And he was killed up there in New Georgia, and I told exactly when and where and how it happened. And they didn't know any of that, none of it. They must have been very appreciative that you could put some closure to the mystery. Yeah, right. And also I had a picture of him, which we took, we took of him on Guadalcanal when we were just in tents and stuff, and somebody took a group picture of several officers, including him. Uh -huh. So I sent her the original. I hadn't made a copy for myself, which it's not so good, but I figured she's entitled to it. <laughs> oh, wow. So she must have yeah, been very happy yeah. with that. Amazing. Okay, tell me what the food was like. You you were you were a man that liked sea rations. You said you yeah, were, yeah, right. I I like the corned beef hash. That that suited me right down to my toes. I didn't mind that at all. Uh -huh. It's uh, I'd like it better if it could be heated up, but I didn't mind it cold. Okay. And also the crackers and the that sort of thing were all right with me. I worked my way through college, and sometimes in college I only eat one meal a day because I was trying to save money to pay my tuition and stuff. And so I was used to, you know, uh, getting along with little and that sort of thing. That didn't bother me. Okay. And um, when, even when they came out with a, first of all, when the, the rations came out, there were just sea rations mm -hmm. with the corned beef, nothing else. Okay. Then they uh, um, uh, had um, added beans and chicken. And there'd be a lot of trading around, us, which I always made out like a bandit on because I, nobody wanted <laughs> corned beef. So I, you got all the corned uh, beef. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, right, yeah. The other thing was when we got out of actual combat and you're, you could get a hot meal and so forth, uh, there, there weren't many rations, that, uh, not a great variety of rations. Uh -huh. First of all, there's no bread, right. nothing with flour, right. with the dehydrated potatoes, uh, uh, tropical butter, uh, uh, dehydrated milk, and uh, powdered milk, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, they uh, they get corn willy, they call it, or corned beef. It was one of the things they get, and it was not very popular. If they could get Argentina corned beef, it would be great, but we usually got Australian corned beef, which is awfully tough. Which was corn willy. Yeah, right. I think I remember reading about that. You know, we used to say that if a ship got sank with a lot of cargo on it and stuff, that all, everything would sink except the corn willy, and that would float to shore. <laughs> we get it. <laughs> no, that'd be the only yeah, thing yeah, you yeah. get. We used to say about the butter that the, they, uh, uh, some of the engineers tried to use it for axle grease on their cars, and they found it wore out the axles. <laughs> <laughs> wow. This is kind of soldier talk. Right, that's pretty. The, the other, the other kind of soldier talk I might tell you about involved myself. Is that the, they said that the, 
Uh, the reason I didn't get shot when I was walking up and down the lines on the top of these hills and so in Guadalcanal was because I was too thin. I'd have to walk by a shadow or a place twice to cast a shadow. And the others disagreed with that. I said, oh, no, that's, they know why the Japs didn't fire at me. They said it's because they saw what a mess I made of things up there, and they figured I was more valuable alive to them than dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, lucky you then. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> if they did think that. Yeah. Um, okay, so supplies. Do you think you had pretty good supplies at most times when you were in the field? Oh, I think so, yeah. You, the, I, I, think that, I, I, I think that the, what was toughest, I, I, I mean, the supplies are rather primitive, mm -hmm. but they were adequate and they were okay for us. I think the medical supplies were, and medical support was not good and inadequate, but I think it was as good as they could do under emergency circumstances. They never prepared for anything like this. Right. And for, for instance, I, I uh, had, um, I don't know whether I broke or lost my glasses on Guadalcanal, but in division headquarters, why they had a little basket full of Japanese glasses they picked up from the field and, you know, the bodies and stuff. And so I went through them, and I found one that suited me fine. So I wore Japanese glasses all the way through New Georgia. Really? I, I couldn't get new glasses till I got back down into the hospital in Espirito Santo. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. That's, well, that's pretty yeah, enterprising. Yeah. Um, how did you feel about pressure and stress? Did you, did you feel a lot of pressure and stress in combat, or did you just not think about it because of the heat of the moment, or can you comment on that at all? I don't think that bothered me too much, but I... Uh, uh, I certainly didn't like being given that assignment the first night. I thought, sure, I was a goner when I took that patrol out. But uh, and uh, the, 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 another patrol I took out, I was supposed to. It w wasn't really a patrol for scouting, but carrying supplies, mm -hmm. uh, because I was the extra officer in the company. Who I uh, when we took got up and were fighting further down the snake's back in that further area there, mm -hmm. why we were supposed to make an attack and capture this ridge, and General Collins is up there behind us, or right almost with us, and we captured it. Mm -hmm. Very By 9 o'clock in the morning, we were on target. Mm -hmm. So he decided, well, we'll go for the next ridge, which is another gully, and uh, deep, deep down the little stream in the bottom, so forth, and so they went on it, and I had been given the job of bringing up the lister bags, with uh, and also ammunition. I had a detail of men who were coming back from the hospital or kitchen personnel and that sort of thing. I must have about seven men with me. Probably, didn't. I was the only one that carried a weapon. There might have been one or two others that had a weapon with them, but they didn't didn't weren't weren't prepared for fighting or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And I got up on this first hill. Uh, right after, by 10 o'clock, I suppose, or 11 or someplace later in the morning. And I was told, well, your, your outfit is going up the, that ridge across the valley there. And you, what you do is you go take this route down into the river bottom there. Mm -hmm. And you, there's a, a trail that goes right. And you turn right on that trail and you follow right into your outfit and you join them. I went down there, and of course I had a lot of trouble with seeing anyhow. I'm nearsighted, number one. Number two, with glasses and things, there's, there's sweat all over them, and they, they, you're not the best sight. Anyhow, I missed the turn. Mm -hmm. So I went on straight and came into a curve in the river, like, like you know, the, and uh, inside the side of the curve, the little kind of peninsula, like it was flat. There was a Japanese bivouac area there, and they had their clothes hanging on the line in there. They had uh, banana leaves or something like that set up on the ground, and they had a machine gun that which was just set to be uh, uh, kept from rain and getting wet, but no, no Japs were in there. And so uh, I figured, well, our job is to get this stuff up to our men. I wasn't going to do anything... With that, we weren't armed particularly, 
So we waded across the stream. There's no path up the hill on the other side, but we just cut our way and fought our way up as best we could. We finally got up to the top but dusk. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next day they sent the 2nd Battalion down and through there to join the 1st Battalion up on the ridge and told them to turn right on the, on the, uh, the, the route. And they turned right on the route and ran into an ambush. So they had a fight with the Japanese in there. So if I, we'd gone in there, they would have just wiped us out because we, 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 uh, hmm. we couldn't have gotten anywhere. So that, I think that helped my reputation. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. mistake that was made yeah, yeah. That saved you, I guess you could yeah, say. Right. Um, did you do anything for good luck? No. no I, I didn't believe in that sort of stuff. Okay. Um, as far as entertainment, were you ever present on bases anywhere where they brought in entertainers and what did the guys do in the field just when you know fighting was was not going on did they do anything for entertainment well they would gamble uh, play cards uh, if they got any mm -hmm. and uh, some of them like to go out to look bird watching and that sort of thing or, really and uh, of course we we'd have some kind of game we'd like to get and dispose of because they bothered us for instance alligators uh, we, we would uh, found in the lagoon next to our bivouac area there was an alligator to come out and wander through our camp uh, during the night because uh, we were camped on what was his hunting route apparently he, so his habit was to come up out and around like that so they got Bangalore torpedoes and set them off under the water there and that brought him up and uh, uh, there was. They killed him, or? Oh yeah, I killed him. Sure, yeah. Okay. yeah. And uh, I, I don't, I don't know. Was, uh, I, I think that's one reason why they had people around trying to give lectures, because the, 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 later in the, the 1944 and 45, mm -hmm. uh, there they had a real big setup on um, papers to come out for news. And um, entertainment and uh, the kinds of things that guys would like to read and that sort of thing. And uh, mm -hmm. but back in the '43, you didn't have that. There was just none of that. Mm -hmm. I I don't know. I I never had any trouble keep myself busy. But uh, uh, well, we did play. Uh, uh, I remember at the division headquarters when I was there. We played. Uh, uh, not basketball, but the kind where you hit the ball over the net with your volleyball. hands. Volleyball. Volleyball, yeah. And we had a general there who used to like to come out and play with us. He's a little short fella. Mm -hmm. And he played against me. And, of course, I am I was lanky and thin and easygoing and that sort of thing. And I wasn't such a hard player. But he played, and he, when he got in that game, it was serious. It was life or death with him. Mm -hmm. And he gets him so mad because I could reach over practically the thing <laughs> and knock the ball away from him, and <laughs> he wow. didn't get it. I was not his most popular opponent. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Well, now one thing, what we, what I was, will suggest we do now is talk about what you did when you were on leave, and obviously being on leave for you was a defining moment in your life. Mm. When you were on leave in in New Zealand uh, when you were you first went there, and that would have been. After Guadalcanal and mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. you went back for rest and rehabilitation, and you happened to meet somebody um, somewhere who had suggested, I believe, that you could come to their home for dinner sometime, but you didn't have all of that man's contact information. Yeah, all right. So you tried to call him. You called the wrong man. Yeah. But that man invited you to his home yeah, anyway. Yeah, right. Yeah. And you went to his home. Yeah. And can you tell? Can you briefly summarize how that led to meeting your future wife? Well, because of that mistake, uh, uh, I got well acquainted with the second one that I met, the James Entrican. Okay. Did you uh, ever see the first one again? Oh, I saw him, but not um, never went to his house or anything. Okay. So you met this other yeah, yeah. Entrican. They were brothers. Oh, they were brothers. Yeah, right. Okay. So you went to the brothers' yeah, house yeah. dinner. And they... Uh, didn't live close to each other either, so, you know, it, but anyhow, they, 
this uh, James Entrecken's son was over in the Middle East, in the New Zealand forces, and his daughter, his wife rather, uh, lived with uh, the Entrecken's there. So I uh, felt, hey, boy, that's a bit of lightning. Yeah, they, uh, they. Uh, uh, I thought I'd take her out on a date to the movies or something or other, and you know, just be friendly. That's all I wanted. And first of all, I uh, before I came overseas, I had gone seriously to the girl, and we broke up. And I had made up my mind that I didn't want to get involved with anybody until I got back from the war. And then, you know, depending upon the war situation, I would, could marry somebody. It's consistent with my circumstances. Right. And so. Whenever I dated in New Zealand, which wasn't too often, but uh, I had a couple others there that um, I just wanted a nice date to go out to a movie or something, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this girl was very nice, and we went out several times. And uh, uh, this was the wife of the guy in the Middle East. Yeah, right. Okay. And uh, the uh, so the important part of that is that. Uh, that made me better acquainted with James Entrican and his family, mm -hmm. because his um, nephew came to visit him with his wife, and uh, his name was Alexander Entrican, and he was forester for the New Department of uh, Dominion, New Zealand, mm -hmm. and it was headquarters in Wellington, which is 450 miles south, okay. the south end of the North Island. And he said, if I was ever in Wellington, you know, he'd take me to lunch at the Wellesley Club and that sort of thing. I thought that'd be nice, but I never expected to be there. But uh, and the circumstances for us didn't look like there's any chance for any doing much of anything. But the one thing that I've had a great desire to do and had had always had it is to travel. I'd like to see the world, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And I knew about New Zealand because I studied about it in college, and uh, I'd like to see the Southern Alps and all that sort of thing. And uh, one time we were sitting at the officer's mess for the battalion, and uh, somebody read an order to just come out that uh, we could get 10 days R&R &R if we applied for it. Mm -hmm. And that's rest and rehabilitation. And so I, uh, I some of the one of them was, I can remember one of them was talking to the table, well, I, I don't, I'd like to do that, but I don't want to do it for two weeks or for some reason or other. Others were thinking, well, they'd like it too, but they're, you know, had various excuses for not doing it right away. I didn't say a word. I just left the table and I went and signed up. I was the only one in the battalion that got to leave for uh -huh. R&R. &R. And I went down to the cooking company travel agency and planned a trip. So I'd go down to Wellington, take a boat across to... Uh, South Island, um, Littleton, and then into Christchurch, and then across to the Southern Alps, and I'd go up to Mount Cook. Mm -hmm. Then I would come back by rail into Christchurch, and I'd go by rail south down to Invercargill down to get to the very south end of, new, of, of the country. Mm -hmm. And I could just about do that in 10 days. And uh, I got my tickets and things as much as I could mm -hmm. from the agency, and paid and I started on my trip. I got down in Wellington. I had one day to sightsee and to go around there. I figured, well, I know who I could have lunch with I, if uh, he happens to be in town and all that. So I called him up and said, oh, yeah, sure, he'd be glad to have me to lunch. So I went to lunch with him, mm -hmm. did sightseeing there and looking around. I take the night boat then from there down to Littleton, which is support for Christchurch. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, in the course of the conversation, he mentioned he had a daughter who was a student nurse down in Ashburton, which is about 50 miles south of Christchurch. And I said, well, which I knew from the maps and so forth, that the train went through there. I said, why don't you give me her telephone number, because the train passes right through there. Mm -hmm. I could just call her up and say hi to her. And he was rather reluctant to give me the number, but he finally did. <laughs> And I stuck in my pocket, and I didn't really know whether I'd have that chance or not. Right. But then, uh, besides that, I wasn't I wasn't thinking of romance or anything like that. It was just uh, somebody uh, uh, right. And so I got I got into uh, uh, Christchurch and went over to 
the Westland drove, went up, walked up the Franz Joseph Glacier and the Fox Glacier, but I didn't get up to the top of Mount uh, Cook. Uh, you had to go around the Hermit the other way. Mm -hmm. So I went back down and in, into Christchurch. It's all up to that point. It's all part of the plan. Mm -hmm. But then I found, when I got into Christchurch, that the trains didn't run on Sunday because of the war. They were saving, you know, petrol and coal and energy, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I stuck in Christchurch for the weekend. I thought, well, no, I don't know anybody in Christchurch, although I had met. The uh, 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 James Entrickens' other daughter, who had married a clergyman by name of Baird and lived in Christchurch, he was he's moderator for the Presbyterian Church in New Zealand, mm -hmm. and uh, I had called them up and they were friendly and all that sort of thing, but they didn't have a young lady to date or anything like that, and uh, uh, I. Uh, did go up to visit them a uh, Saturday, uh, Friday night, I guess, when I got back, and mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned about the uh, Pat Entry, because that was my wife's father's called Pat. Uh, his daughter is down in Ashburton, and I said, does she ever come up to visit you? And I said, well, actually, she hasn't, but, uh, you know, she could, and... Uh, I said, why don't you ask her up this weekend? I, I had a lot of nerve. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, they said, well, no, but you can. We'd be glad to have her if you if you call her up. So I called her up and got her and suggested she come up to Christchurch or relative's place. Of course, I thought that strange, to have a stranger call a girl like that up. And with that kind of situation, it was not a very good one that they should have done the calling, but they wouldn't. They didn't offer to do it, so huh. they told me to do it, so I right. I did it. Well, she she couldn't do that. So it's no, she wasn't coming up to Wellington. Period. Well, I said, well, I'll come down to Christchurch and I mean down to Ashburton and stay Saturday night then. And she said, well, you can't do that because of the train situation. Right. I said, well, I'll take taxis if I can't take trains there. She said, well, there's a 12-mile limit on the trains, on the taxis. And I said, well, I'll just take 12 taxis to get down there. And I don't mean 12, five, six taxis to get down there. I'll get my first 12 miles, and then I'll get the next taxi for the next 12 miles until I got there. <laughs> and uh, she finally gave up. And uh, I said, well, you make a reservation in the hotel for me, and I'll, I'll take care of it. And uh, I'll call you when I get down there. So I did, and on Saturday night, I met her outside the nurse's home, and uh, the, the, by nurse's home is a building which had a 50 or 100 nurses in it. And uh, I was supposed to meet her at 10 o'clock, just, just to meet and have a cup of coffee or tea or something, and then we could decide what to do for Sunday. And uh, the, uh, I came out there, and I was supposed to be 10 o'clock. I got there a little bit early, I suppose. I stood and waited. I swear that uh, 99 of the nurses passed that door before she came out. Mm -hmm. Everybody's out to look me over because there are no Americans in Ashburton. You get you get out of the North Island and uh, the fact you get out of Auckland and just a small unit in Wellington, mm -hmm. there are no Americans there, no, especially soldiers and stuff. So American soldier in uniform, you know, that's that's uh, rare as a hen's tooth and uh, mm -hmm. they uh, uh, anyhow she came out and we took a walk down the road and uh, they sold pork, pork pies even that late on Saturday night so I never heard of such a custom but we each I got each of us a pork pie and we ate it and we liked it and uh, I did mm -hmm. and uh, then we made arrangements for the next day and she thought it'd be nice to have a picnic at noon she had some friends of hers that would invite us over for tea in the afternoon and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So we met on Sunday and and uh, went out on the picnic. And she thought we were going to swim in the Ashburton stream, but actually it came down from the glacier at Mount Cook. And uh, it was ice cold. I was glad that we couldn't swim in it. That was the last thing I'd like to do. And it wasn't that deep anyhow. She didn't really know that. Mm -hmm. So we didn't do anything. We just had our picnic and went and visited her friends, and we had a good time with them. 
and they've been friends of, with, of mine ever since until they died in hmm. some recent years and all that. Hmm. And uh, So you were very taken with her right from the start. You liked her very much. Well, I, I liked her, but I wasn't thinking about marrying her or anything like that. It, it didn't didn't strike me quite that fast, but uh, 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 and we went to church uh, on Sunday night in Anglican Church, and she was, had been a current convert from it, from Presbyterian. I would have preferred she'd been a Presbyterian because that's closer to Methodist than I am. Right. And uh, however, I was impressed with the fact that she was re religious and all that sort of thing. I ran into kids in college and stuff, which I had bad experiences with who didn't seem to have any kind of thoughts like that. And uh, Anyhow, that that's not the deciding factor. I can't tell you what the deciding factor was. I, but Monday morning I got down on the train to uh, get on it and um, of course I said goodbye to her Sunday night and we agreed to write to each other and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, meanwhile, the rest of the night and the morning I got to thinking about that. You write to somebody like this, I go up back up to the islands with our division, we go up towards Japan and the Asia someplace, mm -hmm. and when we come back to the States, we'll never come by New Zealand again, it's too far out of the way of everything. And that's not so hot. And uh, anyhow, I'd like to see a little more of her. So I called her up, I was down with PAC, I was getting ready for the train to go back to Christchurch and uh, decided I'd call her up and if she could get time off that Monday afternoon, I would take it. Mm -hmm. And we could do something together and that sort of thing. We'd have dinner and at least we'd have get a little better acquainted. And uh, I, uh, uh, she agreed that she could do it and uh, she checked on it and could. So I went back and checked in the hotel again. I was going to AWOL then though. Uh, but I figure, well, one day AWO hell, now I can What's stand. That? Yeah, right. And uh, so we went out that night, and I proposed. And uh, I, I, of course, I knew the family. I liked the family. I was in, in Auckland. I thought they were a fine family. I just very admired them. Thought they were just nice people. And. Uh, uh, so she she seemed to like the idea too, and of course uh, we knew that it had to be tentative, or you couldn't do anything specific about it at that point or anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we agreed that we would think in those terms, but you know it wasn't a hard and fast commitment. But uh, mm -hmm. I went on back up to the division, got in a day late found that they were busy packing up to go to New Caledonia. They hadn't missed me at all because of all the turmoil going on about the going up there. So I didn't, uh, I just got, went, went and joined with them, went up to the New Caledonia. Wow, that's amazing. And then, then we corresponded and then through correspondence over the time we, I meanwhile I got to thinking about things and uh, you know if I, we were engaged and I went back to the States any time after the war or anything like that. I'd have to think about thousands of dollars to travel down to New Zealand. And uh, I know she couldn't afford to try her, you know, get, get herself over to the States. But the, if we wanted to really get married, the thing to do is to get married now and then Uncle Sam's problem. So, uh, I, I mean, it's not that all simple, but it, that was one of the factors involved in it. Right. And uh, so about the, by the time we got to June, we both decided that if we got together again, we, we'd like to get married if we could. And by the correspondence back and forth, and of course we had to tell our families about it, and mm -hmm. my father thought it was terrible with my getting involved with a foreign gal and so forth. He thought that was the worst thing. So he he could write me these letters about all these wonderful, beautiful American girls and stuff. <laughs> And um, she had her problems, but she handled them all right, I guess. Right. And her family had had some American experience, so that helped. Right. And um, they, uh, by July, or by, yeah, I guess by the 1st of August, uh, we'd cleared some of the technicalities of mm -hmm. commitment and stuff. But between us, among our, be, ourselves, 
we both knew and acknowledged that uh, when we met again, we might find that we made a mistake, and if we have, we just drop it. You know, we wouldn't go through with it. But for the record and on the surface of it, we had to indicate that we were going to get married, and that was it, period, and all that sort of business. In fact, if she was pregnant or something, that would have been that would have been good because that uh, from that standpoint because then you get your permission and stuff <laughs> in a hurry. But of course, right. um, anyhow, we got the permission, came down, and got married, and uh, we we decided it was the right thing to do. I, I I I have to tell you, I I always worried about that a little bit whether it really was or not, but uh, it's all turned out fine, just great. Wow. And Amazing. she finally, I didn't get over any sooner than the rest, but I might have got over sooner than she would have otherwise because I got over on a bride ship, which brought 12,000 brides over from Australia and New Zealand. Wow, 12,000? Uh, yeah, to San Francisco. That's amazing. Well, I, I guess some of those are kids, but uh, mostly Australian. Uh, wow. But, uh, Were you about the about the same age as she was a few years younger. That yeah, she's a few years younger, not much, about four years younger. So she was in her 20s also. Yeah, yeah right. Mm -hmm. That's an amazing story. That's yeah, my yeah. favorite uh, romantic story. I'm going to pause for a moment. Okay, all right. <laughs>